Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week, where we're going to be talking about manufacturing in America. And that's because my guest today is the CEO and the chairman of American Max Axle and Manufacturing, Mr. Dick Dowk. And Dick, I want to thank you for having joined us here on AutoLine this week. Well, John, it's my honor to be here with you and your viewing audience, and also to be joined by two of my really good friends, Daniel and Jeff. Nice to be with all of you today. And we have to introduce them, too. Daniel Howes from the Detroit News and Jeff Gilbert from WWJ News Radio 950, the CBS affiliate in Detroit. Right. We also should mention that Mr. Dauk is an author, having just written a book called American Drive, and we'll be getting into all that. And we'll be getting into it right now. Dick, what I want to ask you about is whatever gave you the vision to start American Axle? Because I saw that facility, which had been around since some of the buildings since almost World War I. And General Motors had really let this whole facility degenerate into a, a very grimy, even a dangerous place. What did you see in this facility that made you want to take it over and create a whole new company out of it? Well, one must remember that for about 12 years, I had just come off of an incredibly exciting stint of helping save an icon, the Chrysler Corporation. In 1979, Chrysler had been turned over to the government in a Chrysler Loan Guarantee Drawdown Act. And I saw what we had to do in 1980 through 1991 to rebuild Chrysler to be a great, iconic automobile company again. General Motors had drifted the opposite way. While Ford and Chrysler had been recovering in 79 through 91, GM was going the wrong way and by 1992 was in desperate trouble. I saw that General Motors was so badly impacted by the final drive in Ford's business unit that for them to control scheduling a car or a truck, it depended on how many axles they would get or projected to get. I said to my wife, this is right up my alley. Mm -hmm. I understand how to apply engineering and manufacturing and labor together cooperatively and responsibly, and I think I could help them. So along with a friend of mine, Jim McKernan, we jointly went and saw Jack Smith the new president and CEO in 1992 of General Motors, along with an executive friend, uh, J.T. Battenberg, and we asked if we could just be put on as a potential uh, earnest buyer. I knew that they had nine qualified candidates, but we felt that we were the better people and the better company, and the rest, as they say, is history. What is, you know, I've been in your plant many times, Dick, as you know, and, and in fact, I was one of the first people to come in and write right after you took over in 1994. Um, and you look back on it now, and it's, it's a stunning transformation. In Detroit, with a, a largely, although not exclusively, Detroit workforce, but clearly a southeast Michigan workforce, what are the lessons, do you think, for other people who say, you can't do it in Detroit, you can't do it with unions, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. What do you think the lessons are? Well, the first lesson is attitude. I've always had an attitude of positive, responsible, mature, and catalytic. So those that are doing can'ts and can'ts and can'ts, we set them to the side, right. and we get back to a positive attitude, point one. Right. Point two, we must be honest with ourselves that none of us are the boss. The two bosses that you have to respond to are the market and its forces and the customer, whoever the customer may be. When you do that, if you then get a market competitive set of agreements, then you have the chance to win at any and all games in the auto industry. Mm -hmm. And I want to look forward a little bit. We talked a little bit about the history of the company, but you with your book and talks that you've had are almost an evangelist for American manufacturing. Have you seen attitudes change toward manufacturing after the near-death experience we had a couple of years ago? Do you think people value manufacturing more? Well, certainly they value manufacturing more. It's a matter of whether they want to lip service it or if they want to do something that is driving an action plan. Part of my reason to write the book, also create the company, for the last 20 years operate the company and now help the next era of generation 
operate the company into the future is to help America become what it used to be. America used to be powerful and strong because America was notorious for making things, creating jobs, generating wealth, and adding creativity and innovation. We can still do that, but we have fewer people that have aligned their own career to do that. So we're trying to get younger people more excited about manufacturing. We're trying to get other companies to reshore or do other things that will assist us to create jobs and drive uh, the gross domestic product here in America. We still have a great strength of 12 million men and women to get up every day in America and go to work in manufacturing. We're still about 12% of the GDP and we still do about 50% of the private R&D. So it's not like we have gone away. There have been economists and other pundits that have said, well, we don't need manufacturing anymore. They're 100% wrong, it's hogwash. We need to make things. We need to generate production. We need to create new products, and we need to do it globally. We must remember that 95.5% of all the good Lord's people in the world don't live in America. So if you want to really find out where you can get new growth, you've got to look outside the U.S. You've got to look, out, you've got to look throughout the world market. Does that mean, uh, given your experience, the government needs to be more involved? And if so, how? Or is this something that really needs to be, should be, and is best driven, market driven? Well, certainly the government does need to be more involved. And the reason I say this is because most of the policies that have put us in the difficult spot we're in today have come directly out of Washington, D.C. Right. We've got taxes that are just way enormously too expensive. We've got burdens on regulation that are just far too cumbersome and too expensive. We've got different benefits for employee benefits that are out of proportion. We've got tort reform that needs to be given consideration. If we're gonna do any of these things, Daniel, they all have to be done through and with government at the national level. But it sounds like what you're suggesting is you have to take, the government has to do less in a sense and unburden business as a, manufacturing as opposed to having specific industrial manufacturing policies. Well, I think a little bit of both could be appropriate. The government needs to have new national policies that would help manufacturing not have a 20% burden that we carry around right now. Against our nine most favored trading co uh, countries in the world, there is a 20% disadvantage for American manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So you can see where a CEO or the job creator, whoever that final job creator decision maker is, oftentimes will take the path of least resistance economically because it's a whole hell of a lot more expensive to do things in America normally. If you've been at manufacturing a long time like I have, 49 years, you learn there's a lot of different ways to take costs out by design or by complexity reduction or by eliminating peg production or eliminating feather bedded practices or things that I don't want to burden you and the viewing audience with. But if you know how to do those things, you can end up having something that was really stale and stagnant and people wondered why would you even try this thing like American Axle and all of a sudden we have one of the most thrilling companies going and we're still on the New York Stock Exchange from 1999 until 2013 and getting stronger every day. Any hope that this message will resonate in Washington when you see arguments over issues that are far easier to handle than the issues of manufacturing? Well, I never give up on America. I, I never give up on, on our citizenship. I think we're still a very smart society. And of course, we've just had a huge election, so there's an awful lot of change of people that you have to get a hold of. And I've had the privilege in the past to speak to the 50 seated governors all at one time, or to the different senators or different congressional leaders or different uh, governors or whatever the case may be. So I'm certainly not giving up on it. If anything, I'm adding more fuel to the fire. And now that we have done a new executive leadership change. Fortunately for us, our CEO, our son, David Charles Dow, took over September 1, 2012. He and the people can watch the day-to-day -day stuff, and I'm trying to help more on the external things with the government and help to get the bigger picture so we can fix America once and for all and quit having these terrible deficits that we've got, this terrible financial albatross that we put around our neck with $16.5 trillion of debt. Dick, you seem to have something of a mixed bag of relationships with uh, the United Auto Workers Union. <clears throat> you had amazing success with them when you were at Chrysler. At American Motors, or American Axle, it looked like 
You had some success, but not in Detroit. You, you took over this, this dilapid dilapidated uh, manufacturing center, turned it around, made it world class, and yet it's standing empty today because the union in Detroit would not give you what you needed. But in Three Rivers, Michigan, just a few hours drive away, they will welcome you with open arms. And explain a little bit of what's going on there because this region still struggles with this labor management issue that none of the transplants seem to have. Well, fortunately, in my near 30 years of automobile business, General Motors, Volkswagen, Chrysler, I had built a stellar relationship with all constituencies, including the UAW. And that was one of the reasons why we were picked by Jack Smith and General Motors to be the winner in the asset purchase sale to create American Axle. The UAW had such power, they could have vetoed that. They fully supported it, that being Owen Beaver and Stephen Yokish at that time. We had the first 10 years a very good relationship, but there's a couple reasons for that. Number one is they kept having an automobile GM UAW type contract. We could not afford that as an auto tier one supplier. There had been a verbal agreement that within 10 years that we would rearrange that so we would get into an auto tier one economic basis. That unfortunately didn't occur and wouldn't occur at Buffalo, Tonawanda, or Detroit, whereas Three Rivers saw it with a, a very open mind, a very progressive mind, and thus Buffalo and Tonawanda had to be idled, closed, and sold. Detroit had to be idled and closed, and we'll see what we do with the facilities in the future with it. In the meantime, Three Rivers was very open and pragmatic, and now we have a very competitive, fluid, flexible arrangement, and we're growing by leaps and bounds. All the work that when we closed Detroit on February of 2012, all that work stayed within the UAW, in Michigan, within American Axle, and went to Three Rivers. I'll never for ever reason understand why they had a dichotomy of policy. One, because it was Detroit, they wanted a premium wage and a premium benefit, which I knew the customer in the market could not afford. Therefore, we as a company could not afford it. Looking ahead, we're really happy that we've just hired 450 new hires in 2012 at Three Rivers, and we're looking even more excited about 600 more new hires at Three Rivers being hired in Michigan in 2013. So things are looking up. Our long approach to business in a pragmatic way is working very well. We've also opened five factories in the greater Midwest here in the last 36 months, most people don't know that. So we're growing the Midwest in Pennsylvania, the state of Indiana, state of Michigan, state of Ohio, while we're also continuing to grow globally because that's where the majority of the growth is, now is outside the United States. It sounds like you're keeping the door open that someday in the future you could reopen Detroit if you get the right amount of business, the right kind of agreement. Am I reading that into no, it? No, you're reading it wrong. Uh, we will not reopen Detroit in American Axle. But what I have done is very carefully preserved the entire site at Detroit, both internal and external. So if we find the right buyer, and I'm very much a stickler toward finding the right buyer, that possibly that facility could be converted back into a manufacturing arena, or in today's world it could be distribution, or it could be wholesale, or, or sorry, or it could even be logistics and those kinds of things. If you stop and think, of the monstrous and good plants that are in the Detroit area that build vehicles, Jefferson North Assembly Plant, for example, for Chrysler, or the General Motors Assembly Plant that builds the Chevrolet Volt and the Impala and other products there in Hamtramck, Detroit, they need to have just scads of material, and they need to have sequencing, and they need to have all kinds of services provided to them. There is not a better manufacturing location available in Detroit, Michigan, than what used to be American Axle Manufacturing Detroit, Gear and Axle in Detroit Forge. So we will quietly and carefully study where and how we can possibly have that facility uh, be re-energized in the future by a different employer. Dick, why do you say categorically that you wouldn't reopen it if you're opening in other, part, other sites around the country if you had, to John's point, a, a, a competitive kind of deal that you have in Three Rivers? First of all, I gave them 18 years of opportunity to do what they should have done. Mm -hmm. 
and they chose not to do it over a multi-series of negotiated contracts. And there comes a time you got a fish or cut bait. We had to then decide to move ahead as a company and progressively grow Three Rivers, expand into Auburn Hills, expand into Oxford, expand into Lancaster, Pennsylvania, into Fort Wayne, Indiana, and others, not to Borea, Minerva, Malvern, Ohio. Um, and Detroit simply didn't want to come around. Now the workforce has been disbanded. The facility has been preserved, internal and external, including infrastructure, which is very, very critical in the world of manufacturing that I live in. So we are evaluating a lot of things to do, but I must not sit around and wait about what might come. I've got to go ahead and proceed because the dynamics of world economics and competitiveness require us to do that. Dick, I can tell you really like talking about all the people that you're hiring, and you're involved in a, a project called the Job Creators Alliance with a guy named Bernie Marcus, who used to be uh, the CEO of Home Depot. Tell us a little bit about what this effort is all about and your involvement in it. Well, having been a job creator myself at the CEO level now for well over 20 years, I was delighted to meet Mr. Marcus and also Home Depot, as you indicated, his firm, or Staples, another well-known firm. There's about two or three dozen CEOs that got together to create this job creators because they want to make sure that the small business had a voice, not just a large business, and they want to make sure that we had a chance to go back in and say manufacturing means something. Creating product, creating value, creating wealth. What is everybody having these forums about? They're about jobs. Well, where you create jobs is in manufacturing by designing, engineering, tooling, processing, producing, uh, doing all the logistics that have to be done. I've seen it happen for my 50 years that I've been in the automobile business and I want to continue helping, and so therefore, I'm lending my voice also. We're going to have a large forum gathering next month in April down in Palm Beach, Florida, and Mr. Marcus and myself and others will meet with government leaders. I think the former governor, uh, Jeb Bush of Florida, will be there. A former Republican presidential nominee, Herman Cain, will be there. I'm very happy to meet with those men. Most of them don't have manufacturing backgrounds. I have a powerful manufacturing background, and I'm trying to get into the government heads, trying to get into the administrative heads, trying to get into the founders of different firms, be it Home Depot or Staples or whatever, because we want to create jobs. We want to put people back to work. We can't afford to have as many people unemployed today as we did in 1930 in the Depression. In 1930, we had 12 and a half million people unemployed. Today, we have 12.8 million unemployed. Well, that's a lot of folks. Sure. They need jobs. And the great difference that occurred from previous recessions in recovery to today's very weak recovery is that manufacturing has eroded away. Over 42,000 factories closed in America from year 2001 to 2012. And the average factory employed over 500 men and women. <clears throat> well, that goes anywhere from Nebraska to California to Texas to Minnesota to Rhode Island to Michigan. <clears throat> so I want to get back in here and say, if we do things like American Drive, nowhere was it tougher to rekindle the spirit of work ethic and quality of work and integrity of work and flexibility and fluidity, et cetera, than in Detroit, Michigan with American Axle. Today, we've just finished 10 straight years of less than single-digit PPM. That's how you measure quality in the auto industry, parts per million. We have near perfection in America and throughout the world. So I'm not worried about Americans as people. They will work. We'll get the work ethic. We'll get the quality. We'll get the output. What we had to do was eliminate man-made agreements that were no good. Peg production, feather bedded practices. Most American adults don't even know what I'm talking about. How do you think I went from 9,500 axles a day on March 1, 1994 to 12,000 axles a day by March 31st of 1994? I eliminated pegs, eliminated feather bedded practices, went right to the worker, 
had the employees representative from their union there and talked to them straight talk and said, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to let this place again ever injure General Motors where they can't schedule their vehicle assembly plants, not injure General Motors where they can't get their quality right, not injure General Motors where the warranty became ballooned and out of control. I want new product. I want new launches. I want new training. And we've now put in a quarter of a billion dollars into training alone, into our workforce. So we're very much people-focused business. We're very focused on product, and we're very focused on the customer in the market. What have you learned as a global company of the difference between factories you put up here in the United States and in other markets around the world? There was a big rush 10 years ago to <clears throat> offshore to send things to other markets. Now a lot of that work is coming back. Where is the proper balance? Well, let's, let's take a what did I learn? What I've learned, three things, is the governments of the foreign countries will do anything. They'll do handstands to help you to get into manufacturing. If I'm in China or India or Brazil or Mexico or Thailand, whatever, our governments oftentimes don't even show up. They talk a big game, and when there's political times, they especially talk about manufacturing. But when you get to action plans, they're pretty well empty. That's point one. Point two, when you go to these other countries, they already have schools in place, be it vocational technical schools or engineering schools, so the talent is there. Whereas today, what is one of our problems in America? We have jobs available. We don't have the talented people to put into those jobs. So they have those already in these foreign countries. Point three is when you get there, the educational level just far surpasses America. It leaves us, when I first started American Axle, the average worker unfortunately only had nine and a half years of high school. So they hadn't been to school in 30 years, and therefore they actually were really working on about a sixth grade equivalent education. We worked very hard to bring that up to an associate's degree over about a 10, 12 year period. And now if I'm in, again, the foreign countries, almost every person I put on payroll now, hourly and or salary, is a four year PE professional engineer by degree. Dick, we've come through a very difficult time in this in this town, and these companies are making more money than they've made, and certainly since I've been paying attention. Uh, and you've been seeing it many, many times. Do you think complacency is a real risk for the auto industry, the Detroit-based auto industry, and we're going to get fat and sloppy again, or are things different this time, and if so, how? Well, I'd like to think that the American people are not that short-sighted. We went through brutal times. I saw it starting in 2005 when our profits started to reduce for the first time in American Axle. In 2006, if you recall, General Motors lost over $10 billion that year. It drove my company into a lost position for the first time in 13 years. Then we went to the really brutal years of 2008 and 9 where eventually General Motors went bankrupt, Chrysler went bankrupt, the government had to step in. And you guys came close, right? We were very close, but I played a lot of ball games. They didn't know how close it is, it's whether you win or lose. And there was five things I laid out to my board of directors, and we did these five things. One, we avoided bankruptcy. Two, we avoided bailout. Mm -hmm. Three, we avoided union takeover or ownership of our company. Four, we stabilized our management team so there wasn't mass churning. And five, we kept with a strong governance for policy and overall governance authority. And by doing that, we also preserved value. We preserved over $1.2 billion of value so the shareholder didn't get shot through the head like so many companies that just took the bankruptcy route and with that the shareholder got zero. So I've seen it all, lived it all, and having worked at Chrysler for that 12-year period under those god-awfully difficult conditions in 80 through 83, and then see the strength of it, be able to purchase and bring back to America American Motors, which had been lost in 1978 to the French. Mm -hmm. And we brought it back and preserved, of course, the great brand Jeep. And Jeep is today at the plant that I built for Chrysler and Mr. Iacocca and Jefferson North Assembly, probably 
one of the greatest cash and profit generators there are. And yet in those days, everybody said, Dick, don't build another plant in Detroit. Don't do another product in Detroit. And I said, Detroit's not the issue. It's your attitude. Get your attitude right. Get your business right. And in our company, the first thing we did once we got going in March 194 is we put in a totally new culture. I did not want a GM and UAW culture. Mm -hmm. I wanted an American axle culture where every man and woman came to work, was not entitled to that job, had to earn that job over each day, had to participate, contribute, stop the pegging, stop the feather bedding, stop the moaning, come to work, don't be absent, don't be one of the problems, grow up, and let's show that Detroit can become what it was at one time, the arsenal of democracy. Well, the arsenal of democracy now is an arsenal of economic competitiveness. That's what we have to do. And with that, I'll uh, encourage the audience to go check it out. American Drive, Dick Dow, thanks so much for coming on the show. Daniel Howes, Jeff Gilbert, want to thank you all, and thanks for having tuned in to Out of Line this week. John, it was my honor. Delighted to have you and delighted to be with you and the guys again. Thank you. Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The hybrid game MPG Challenge.